Hello again, Year 10. Uh, so we're moving on and starting to look at the structure of this poem. The way it's put together, the way it's sequenced, some of the repeated issues, ideas, some of the repeated techniques as we move through, as Owen moves through this poem. Um, and the first one of these that we're going to look at, um, and we'll do this in green, is just the way sibilance abounds in this poem. Um, so I'm going to colour code that in green and highlight this in green because it is a really remarkable frequency of sibilance. If we just look, we have the S there, the the iced east winds that nigh thus weirdly keep awake because the night is silent, salient, flares, confuse, whisper, curious, nervous, nothing happens, silence, sentries. Just in that first stanza, you can see immediately this plethora of sibilant sounds and it, and it runs on and on and on. Um, we see the gusts, we see brambles, agonies, rumbles, um, some other war. And it, you know, it carries on and on and on, you know, and you could just go through and this you should be doing is going through and just thinking, actually, where are all of these sounds as they run through the poem? I'm going to come back to this quotation in a little bit. Um, but actually, we have this sibilance that runs all the way through the poem. And it is this very strongly repeating pattern. And as I've said lots of times, sound patterns, phonetics don't create meaning by itself but actually add tone and add a quality. And it's a quiet quality. And this is one of the striking things about this poem. Normally in war poetry, you have plosives, P's and B sounds or dentals, D's and T sounds. These explosive, harsh, aggressive sounds. But this is not a poem about explosions and bombs and damage and pain and suffering. Not on the physical level anyway. This is a quiet poem. This is a poem about stasis. This is a purgatorial poem where you're stuck. And it's fitting that we have this sibilance that runs through. It reflects the quiet suffering. And the fact that the, those sibilant sounds run all the way through the run all the way through the poem emphasizes that that suffering is perpetual. It's constant. And that suffering is inescapable. And that's a really useful starting point. This is really unusual for conflict poetry. Very often it's the harsh B's and P's and the D's and T's. And they are here in this poem, but nowhere near as often as, the, as this sibilant sound that runs all the way through the poem. Um, so the next thing that we're just going to have a look at is the end of each stanza, which I'll just highlight in pink. And you'll notice that we have four lines and a fifth line that is much shorter. Um, these are conclusive lines, some of them are questions, some of them are assertive statements. All of them are always questioning their purpose and considering the idea that perhaps what they're doing is purposeless, that what they're doing has no end, that there is no reason or rationale. And in fact, many of the ends of these stanzas come back to negation again and again. So negation is where things are deleted, taken away. So the word nothing is in two parts. OK, no thing. When things are deleted, when things lose meaning. And we said in the previous video that this is inherently a nihilistic poem where God is dead, where there's no redemption, there's no means of moving forward, no means of moving on. It's as though the soldiers themselves are being negated all the way through the poem. And we see that again and again. We have this repetition of this phrase, nothing happens, nothing happens, but nothing happens, but nothing happens. And that's how the poem ends, that nothing has really happened, that there is no change. There is no sense of progress. There is no hope as a consequence of those things. And all the time you have this connective dropped in but. So despite the suffering and despite the sacrifice, nothing changes. And that is and this is a contextual point, is an anti-heroic idea. That despite the fact that you have to stoically put up with that and to be stoic, oh, I'm sorry about that, to be stoic 
means to endure and to tolerate. That nothing changes and nothing happens. That they are not achieving anything as they move through this poem. And as they move through time in battle and time at war all the time. And you have that frustration. And actually, when we keep moving through, and I'm just going to swap to a red pen now for this, is the questions that this poem asks. What are we doing here? Is it that we are dying? So we have these two questions. And again, this reinforces the purposelessness, that there's war has no end, that there's no reason or rationale to how they're working and how they're fighting. And Owen asks that question, is it that we are dying? It reinforces this purgatorial idea again. And it no, should be no surprise then that that then triggers off this discussion, this realisation that they are only ghosts that drag home. So they question life and mortality. And Owen is somewhat morbidly recognising it is only their ghosts that will get home. And, he, and with that, we get the sense that they are stuck. And we know that this is a poem out about stasis, and I'll keep coming to that idea again and again. I'll just scream it at the bottom there for you. Um, but we know then that all their eyes are ice at the end, that the frost will fasten on this mud and us. So we know, and Owen is stressing, that their bodies will not return, their bodies will not be able to get away. Um, and there's lots of patterns in this poem that sort of build on that. But I think what's interesting is that we have these monosyllabic moments, the and they're harsher. Monosyllables, don't forget, are words with only a single syllable so this statement here all their eyes are ice and we lie out here on on this mud and us is stressed as well these monosyllabic statements um, and again i'll just annotate this in blue is these are harder harsher statements they're perhaps reflective of the brutality of World War One. So making a connection there between the structure and the context of the poem. Um, and as the poem goes on, you'll notice, and I'm just going to swap to orange now, that there are lots of ellipses and dashes. So these dot dot dots are ellipses. As we just go through, we can see them. And then equally, there are dashes that are doing the same job. So we have some here, we have one here. So, and I'll just annotate this in orange so you can continue to make the connection. So a dot, dot, dot is an ellipsis. And the dash is a dash. But these all are gaps. They're pauses, they're hesitations. And I think Owen's doing this for a few reasons. Um, number one, it's about the passage of time. We know this is a poem about waiting. We know this is a poem about things continuing and things being perpetual and war being perpetual and unstoppable. And particularly in this first stanza up here, you have three ellipses in a row. These long pauses, our brains ache in the merciless iced east winds that nigh us. Wearied we keep awake because the night is silent. Low drooping flares confuse our memory of the salient. Three very different things. We talk about the brain aching, being weary, and then the flares. These three very separate ideas. It's as though with these gaps and these pauses, an ellipsis is just a gap. The poem itself is fragmented. It's as though the reality they experience is increasingly fragmented and broken. And of course, that's really what they were seeing, you know, fighting in the north of France um, and in Belgium in particular, which is where the fiercest fighting was in World War One. You saw the landscape completely transformed. It was an open agricultural landscape. And actually, we saw it transformed into this kind of broken shell, destroyed, pocked landscape. 
And we see then with Owen adopting these ellipses and these dashes, this broken and fractured structure that runs all the way through the poem. Um, that, you know, that gives you some sense of the structure of this poem. And we talked earlier um, about the number of mechanical synthetic references, references to weapons being massively outnumbered by the number of it references to, to nature and the natural world. And it's therefore nature and the natural world that is this greater threat. Um, and also, in terms of the sequencing of the poem, the poem does become increasingly purgatorial as it continues. And as we move forward, we see the ghosts appearing um, and the detachment from the mortal world. And it shouldn't therefore surprise us that we flick to the future tense in the final stages of the poem, because tonight the frost will fasten on this mud and us. Owen is predicting that the weather will close in around them, mean that they absolutely cannot escape. He's predicting that we, they will be frozen in the trenches perpetually and forever. That will be a space and a location that is inescapable to them. And that's really what he's predicting. But equally, at the same time, this sense that nothing happens is how he finishes the poem. So he predicts that they won't be able to escape, but at the same time, nothing happens, nothing will change, nothing will cease. That should give you a sense, on top of the first video, of some of the structure of the poem. And in the next video, we will look at exploding some quotations and saying a lot about a little. But do add to this, add your own ideas, bring in some other things from lessons that you've got or from watching Mr Bruff videos or accessing materials on OneDrive. Um, and actually, on OneNote, sorry. Um, and also, you know, do upload your photographs of your annotations so I can check over them and make sure the ideas that you add are of the highest quality and I can give you some suggestions about other directions you could take your ideas as you continue to move forward in your study of this poem and the rest of the Power and Conflict collection. One more video to go, exploding quotations, taking them apart in some detail.